Our scripture reading comes from Hebrews chapter 12, verses 1 and 2. Hear now the word of God. Therefore, since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, let us also lay aside every weight and sin which clings so closely, and let us run with endurance the race that is set before us, looking to Jesus, the founder and perfecter of our faith, who, for the joy that was set before him, endured the cross, despising the shame, and is seated at the right hand of the throne of God. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. What makes Jesus happy? Think of your answer in your mind. I would say what makes Jesus happy is glorifying his Father. I think that's a good biblical answer. But you may have come up with another answer. A sinner who repents makes Jesus happy. When we enjoy God, that makes Jesus happy. Another biblical answer would be sharing a meal with his friends makes Jesus happy. During his ministry, it certainly did. And why would we suppose that he has changed? Especially since one of the sacraments he gave us is a meal. Many things make Jesus happy. But I direct your attention to the answer given in chapter 3 of Dane Ortland's book, Gentle and Lowly. This is a book we're having conversations with this month and next month. In January, our sermons uh, interact with this book. And we have a 10-week class on Wednesday evenings. And we have new life groups that are gathering around this book. So we're, we're talking about it, dealing with it right now. And in chapter three of this book, the answer Ortland gives to the question, what makes Jesus happy, is this. Christ's own joy, comfort, happiness, and glory are increased and enlarged by his showing grace and mercy in pardoning, relieving, and comforting his members here on earth. That answer needs some unpacking. First of all, you need to know that it's not original to Ortland. He got it from Thomas Goodwin, a 17th century pastor who has an interesting story that I will share with you later. Goodwin taught Ortland, who got so excited about what he learned that he wrote this book, Gentle and Lowly. Um, second, notice that it says his members here on earth. Jesus enjoys showing mercy to his members here on earth, meaning the people who belong to him. Now, this is a biblical way of speaking. Paul wrote to the church in Corinth, you are the body of Christ and individually members of it. Goodwin's point is that Christ cherishes us as we cherish a part of our body. If your arm hurts, you don't cut it off, you try to heal it. The main idea here, though, is that what makes Jesus happy is forgiving and comforting his people. This means that he does not forgive us reluctantly. He enjoys forgiving us. He is happy when we obey him, but we also make him happy when we turn to him when we have failed. Our failure doesn't make him happy. Our sin does not make him happy. But when we turn to him in our need, because we have done something we shouldn't have or simply because we are suffering, that makes Jesus happy. He always wants us to turn to him in our time of need. So that is Goodwin's answer and Ortland's answer. The question is, is that also a biblical answer? It's certainly an answer we want to be true, but we don't believe things because we want them to be true. We believe them because they are biblical. To support this idea, Ortland appeals to our scripture reading today. So what I want to do is explore our scripture reading, and then we will be in a position to know whether he is on target or not. So let's begin. 
Our scripture reading comes from the first two verses of chapter 12 in the book of Hebrews. But in this case, I think, frankly, the chapter break comes at a really poor place. And you may know that the chapter and verse divisions in the Bible were added centuries after the Bible was written. So the chapter break here does not go back to the original author. And in this case, I think that it would be better in another place because our scripture reading really goes better with what comes before it than what comes after it. In chapter 11, you have that great chapter on faith. Faith is defined, and then all these examples of people who had faith are listed. Then you have our scripture reading, which begins with the word, therefore, meaning that it concludes what has come before it. So you get all these examples of faith, and then our passage introduces the best example of faith of all, Jesus, the founder and perfecter of our faith. The purpose of our passage, what it is trying to do, is encourage endurance. The Christian life is not a sprint. It's a marathon. And we can become weary along the way. We get tired. We get discouraged. Especially if you face opposition or persecution. You might be tempted to give up. The book of Hebrews was written at a time when it was especially difficult to be a Christian. The Roman Empire in the middle of the first century uh, provided laws that legally recognized Judaism in a way that it did not recognize Christianity. Now, Jews faced discrimination. Romans tended to be very anti-Semitic. And yet, Judaism had an official legal toleration that Christianity did not. In the beginning, Roman officials had difficulty telling the difference between Christians and Jews. Christianity, to them, looked like just another form of Judaism. But once the difference began to become clear, persecution increased significantly. For example, Jews were not required to worship the emperor, but Christians were not exempted from this. And many Christians paid a terrible price for their commitment to Jesus because they refused to worship the emperor. You can see how, in this situation, many might be tempted to give up their Christian faith and return to the synagogue in order to avoid persecution. The writer of Hebrews encourages them to stay faithful to Jesus Christ and to run with endurance. So the main idea is to run with endurance. That's its message and its message to us today. Whatever course God sets before us, whatever obstacles we might face, we should run with endurance. But how do we do that? Our scripture reading gives us Two instructions. First, it says, lay aside every weight and sin which clings so closely. If you're running a long distance race, you must travel light. You can't have a lot of extra weight and baggage. And obviously, sin holds us back as we try to follow Jesus. But our scripture reading is talking about much more than just sin. It's also talking about habits and ambitions and attachments that, while they may not be sinful in and of themselves, prevent us from following Jesus the way we should. For example, there's nothing wrong with wanting to be the best at what you do, but what will you have to sacrifice to achieve that? And is it worth it? Or what do you do with your free time? And what do you not do? And perhaps there is something in your life that is hindering you as you try to follow Jesus. Maybe there's something you need to lay aside and leave behind. Second, our passage 
gives us examples to follow, role models, heroes of faith. It begins by talking about a great cloud of witnesses. And here it has in mind all those examples of faith mentioned in chapter 11. And as we read this, we should think of an athletic arena. All those who have come before us are in the stands cheering us on. Yes, they have left us an example to follow. They are role models for us in many ways, but they are also rooting for us. And of course, the greatest example of all is Jesus himself. And our passage tells us to look to him. Now, this also is an athletic metaphor. In track and field today, we paint lines on the track to create lanes and the runners stay in their lanes. In the ancient world, they didn't have lines on the track. Those hadn't been invented yet. So how did the runners keep from bumping into each other? How did they stay on a course? Well, at the end of the track, beyond the finish line, there were poles for each runner. And if you were running, you would identify your pole and you would stare straight at it and you would run directly toward it. And in that way, you would stay in your lane, so to speak. Well, for us Christians, Jesus is that, that pole, that marker, that goal. We fix our eyes on him and we run straight toward him. Or to express that in more literal language, we obey his teachings and we follow his example. He is an example for us, not simply because of who he is, but because of what he did. He ran the race the Father set for him, even though that meant dying on a cross. He endured, he persevered, he ran the race, he won the prize, he sat down at the Father's right hand, he shows us how to do it. We set aside the sin and anything else that's going to slow us down. We fix our eyes on Jesus. We run right toward him. And when we encounter obstacles, when we encounter suffering, we look beyond them. We look to the joy that he has set before us. And we keep going. I mentioned Thomas Goodwin earlier. He's the 17th century pastor who inspired Ortland to write Gentle and Lowly. And Goodwin is a good example of looking to Jesus. He was born in the year 1600, and he grew up in a Christian home. But when he went to Cambridge University as a teenager, he fell into a party crowd. And he was all about having fun with his friends. He also became very ambitious. He wanted to become famous and admired. He loved applause and appreciation. In other words, he was just like many young people today, right? Surprisingly so. But then when he was 20 years old, he heard a funeral sermon that shook him up and caused him to rethink his life. And it started him on a spiritual journey that lasted for seven miserable, unhappy years. And he was unhappy because he realized he needed something. He needed God. He needed to be one of God's people. But how would he know if he was? Well, he looked within himself and he reasoned, well, if I belong to God, then I'm going to love God and I'll love other people. When he looked in his heart, he didn't find a lot of love. He said, well, if I belong to God, then I'm going to enjoy worship. I will love praising God. He went to church and he didn't enjoy it. And he was worried, what is wrong with me? Why don't I not see any evidence that God is, is working in my life? Why am I not good enough? Why can't I measure up? And then someone said to him, stop looking at yourself. Look to Christ. If you're worried about your salvation, don't examine your soul. Look to Christ crucified. His blood can cleanse you. 
run to him. And that's what Goodwin did. And he was transformed. And he began to preach the Savior we read about in Gentle and Lowly. The Savior we meet in the Gospels. So Goodwin taught Ortland, and Ortland wants to pass on to us the idea that forgiving and comforting his people makes Jesus happy. And Ortland appeals to our scripture reading, especially the line that says, For the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising its shame. So the question becomes, what is the joy? What joy did Jesus look to that enabled him to endure the cross? Now, like the question, what makes Jesus happy? This one could have many good answers. The joy of returning to his heavenly glory. The joy of sitting down at his father's right hand the joy of accomplishing the will of his Father, the joy of saving us. And then there's the answer that Ortland gives in the book, the joy of seeing his people forgiven. And he's not wrong in that. I think it is all of these things together. And we see them all come together in a beautiful vision we find in the book of the Revelation that shows us the ultimate goal God has, the direction toward which he is moving history and our lives. And that passage in Revelation says this, After this I looked, and behold, a great multitude that no one could number, from every nation, from all tribes and peoples and languages, standing before the throne and before the Lamb, clothed in white robes, with palm branches in their hands, and crying out with a loud voice, salvation belongs to our God who sits upon the throne and to the Lamb. That's the joy. The joy of that moment it's what enabled Jesus to endure the cross. He makes it possible. He makes it a reality. And that joy can sustain us too. We can look past our suffering and our failure to that moment, knowing that we will be there. We will be part of that. And that joy can sustain us. And of course, Jesus is going to have to get us there. And all along the way, I think he finds joy in doing what it takes to get us there. And that means joy in forgiving us and comforting us. Therefore, I think Ortland is on target. The joy that enabled Jesus to endure the cross was certainly more than forgiving you and me, but that's a very important part of it. In the Gospel of John, Jesus talks about the people whom his Father has given him. And he says that he saves them. And he takes great pride in saying he does not lose even one. These are God's children upon whom he has set his love. And Jesus delights to forgive them and to comfort them when they are hurting, and to pick them up when they fail. I think about a sad story that I read about. There was a teenage boy who was texting on his phone and thought he was communicating with a girl in his class he had a crush on. And she was flirting with him and asked him to send an explicit photo of himself, which he finally did. And when he did, he realized to his horror that it was not that girl, but rather he was communicating with some men he did not know. And they proceeded to blackmail him, threatening to send the picture to his parents and youth leaders and teachers and other students if he didn't do what they said. 
And he got in deeper and deeper and ended up doing things he was very ashamed of. The story has a happy ending, fortunately. I don't know the details, but somehow the FBI became involved and they caught the culprits. It could have had a much worse ending. But how much better if the boy had simply gone to his parents right away? I think every parent would want their child to come to them in a situation like that. Yes, it would be embarrassing at first, but what parent wouldn't want to help their child in a time of crisis like that? And in a similar way, Jesus wants us to come to him in our need. We make a mess of things. We hurt others. We hurt ourselves. Or maybe sometimes life is just simply too much for us. All our problems begin to crush us. And you know, God always knows everything. We can never hide anything from him. But sometimes our pride keeps us from turning to him. We tell ourselves, I'm not so bad. Or it's really that other person's fault. Or I'm strong enough to handle this. Or whatever it is we tell ourselves. How much better if we simply turn to our Savior? I don't know that boy's parents don't know how they would have reacted if he had gone to them immediately. But I know Jesus. And I know that he will welcome you with compassion and understanding. He will never turn you away. He will honor you. He will protect your dignity. Because he loves you. He delights to forgive and comfort his people. But then, how do you know you're one of his people? Well, that's easy. Remember Thomas Goodwin? Don't look to yourself the way he did at first, thinking, oh, I'll be this or I'll be that. No, look to Christ. His death is sufficient to save you. Go to him. Run to him. He will not turn you away. He never turns anyone away. Those who do not belong to him are those who refuse to hear his voice. Or if they hear it, they won't go to him. Don't let that be you. We have an amazing, wonderful Savior who is far, far better than we deserve. So if you know you need a Savior, go to him. And if you think you don't need a Savior, then you really need a Savior. Amen.